Now let's study some examples with exponential representation of a complex numbers, just to see how it simplifies things in complex algebra. Our first example is to find the modulus and the argument of the following complex number. z equals 1 plus i to the power of 123. Well, first of all, we simplify its second part. We represent i with its exponential form as e to i pi by 2. So i to the power of 123 becomes e to the power of i pi by 2 multiplied by 120 plus 3 which is turned into e to the power of 60 pi i plus 3 pi i by 2. Well, as we mentioned earlier, the exponential is a 2 pi i periodic function. That is the reason why we can get rid of this 60 pi i term in the exponent. It's identical to 0. And we obtain e to the 3 pi i by 2, which is a complex number with unit modulus, but inclined by angle 3 pi by 2, which is nothing but minus i. So this way we simplified our complex number and it became 1 minus i. Now it's trivial to find its modulus and argument. So the modulus of z is obviously square root of 2, while its argument, well, it's a number in the fourth quadrant inclined by angle 45. So if we choose the argument belonging to the strip from negative pi to pi, our argument will be equal to minus pi by 4. And this way our complex number represented as square root of 2 times e to minus i pi by 4. Now our next example. The assignment is the same. Find the modulus and the argument of the following complex number. This time the complex number is the ratio of 1 minus i to the power of 6 divided by 1 plus i square root of 3 to the power of 5. Well, first of all, let's work with the complex number in the denominator. We already know its exponential representation. It's simply square root of 2 times e to minus i pi by 4. Now complex number in denominator. Let's find its modulus. It's 2. So we factor out 2 and obtain 1 half plus i square root of 3 by 2. So the cosine of our argument is 1 half while the sine is square root of 3 by 2, which gives us the argument equal to pi by 3. So our complex number in the denominator is now represented as 2 times e to the power of i pi by 3. And now let's plug in these two representations into our nominator and denominator respectively to obtain square root of 2 to the power of 6 times e to minus 3 pi i by 2 divided by 2 to the power of 5 times e to 5 pi i by 3. Well, first of all, I don't like this 5 pi by 3. I'd like to represent it as 6 pi minus pi. What it gives me is that now in the denominator I will have e to 2 pi i minus pi i by 3. And of course now I can get rid of 2 pi i. The same simplification goes for nominator. Let's represent minus 3 pi by 2 as minus 2 pi plus pi by 2. And in the end we obtain in the denominator minus 2 pi i plus pi i by 2. And as before, we get rid of minus 2 pi i in the exponent of the exponential. Therefore, we obtain a very simple complex number. Square root of 2 raised to the power of 6 gives us 8. 2 to the power of 5 gives us 32. And we have the ratio of two exponentials, e to pi i by 2 and e to minus pi i by 3, which gives us 1 quarter times e to the power of 5 pi i by 6. And this is our final answer. We obtained our complex number with the modulus equal to 1 quarter and argument equal to 5 pi by 6. So let's study our next example. And this one is going to be really important because it demonstrates some essential tricks which will be quite useful in your future calculations. So the example goes as follows. Find the sum of sines. Sin theta plus sin 2 theta plus and so on plus sin and theta. The best way to proceed here is to convert sine into an exponential. For example, sine theta can be represented as an imaginary part of e to i theta. The same is true for sine 2 theta and so on. So in the end, we represent this sum as imaginary part of the sum of exponentials e to i theta plus e to 2 i theta and so on plus e to n i theta. But this is nothing but a geometric series like q plus q squared plus plus q to the power of n. 
and we have a formula for this geometric series. Though I don't remember it now, but what we can do, we can factor out q, and then in the braces we'll obtain 1 plus q plus and so on plus q to the power of n minus 1. Well, for this one, I do remember the formula. It's q to the power of n minus 1 over q minus 1. That's it. So now we can employ this formula for our identity. We obtain the imaginary part of e to i theta times the fraction, and the denominator is e to i n theta minus 1, while the denominator is e to i theta minus 1. And here comes an important trick. Whenever you deal with the difference or sum of two exponentials, for example, like e to i alpha plus minus e to i beta. You can simplify things by factoring out a suitable combination. For example, let's consider a plus sign here. And once you factor out e to i alpha plus beta by 2, you will end up with the following sum in the braces. e to i alpha minus beta by 2 plus e to minus i alpha minus beta by 2. But in the braces, this is nothing but a cosine function. So this way, the sum of two exponentials is represented as e to i alpha plus beta by 2 times 2 cosine of alpha minus beta by 2. And let's see how this trick works in this particular example. So let's address the denominator. It contains indeed the difference of two exponentials, e to i theta and 1, which is e to i 0. And according to what was just said, we need to factor out e to i theta by 2. So let's do this. And in the brackets, we'll obtain e to i theta by 2 minus e to minus i theta by 2. Now, this is nothing but 2i sine theta by 2, according to Euler's identity. So let's write it down. And let's do the same trick for nominator. Again, we have a difference of two exponentials, e to i and theta and e to i0. So we factor out e to i and theta by 2. And in the braces, we'll obtain again e to i and theta by 2 minus e to minus i and theta by 2, which is nothing but 2i sine of and theta by 2. And now we see how things are simplified. We cancel out 2i prefactors, and we have a ratio of sine of n theta by 2 and sine of theta by 2. Since it's real, it can be factored out from our imaginary operator. So we obtain sine of n theta by 2 over sine of theta by 2 times the imaginary part of what? Of e to i theta plus i n theta and minus i theta by 2. And it's an imaginary part of a simple exponential, which obviously gives us sine of the argument of the exponential. And we obtain sine n theta by 2 over sine theta by 2 times sine of n plus 1 over 2 theta. And finally, one more application of an exponential representation of a complex number namely the solution of the simplest power-type complex equations. You may though find that this equation is a little bit too oversimplified, but believe me, in real applications like computer integrals, you will constantly encounter that kind of equations. So the idea is here, just you need to learn how to solve them quickly and just go further. So the equation is as follows. z cubed is equal to minus i. Now to solve this equation quickly, you need to convert its left and right hand sides into the exponential form. For example, the left-hand side, z is represented as modulus of z times e to i, the argument of z, phi. This way z cubed is turned into modulus of z cubed times e to 3i phi. Now the right-hand side, minus i. It's a complex number with unit modulus and argument which is equal to minus pi by 2. So we write here e to minus i pi by 2. But here we'll have to remember that the argument of the complex number is actually defined modulo 2 pi. So we add here in the exponent 2 pi i n additional term. Now why do we need it? Well, that's because we deal here with cubic equation and it should have three complex roots. And this addition allows us to find all these three roots. So let's see how this comes about. First of all, we have an equality of two complex numbers here on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And two complex numbers are equal if the arguments are equal and the moduli are also equal. So let's write down the corresponding equations. So modulus of z cubed is equal to 1. And this equation will always have only one root. Why? Because the modulus is positive. So in our particular case, the solution will be modulus of z is equal to 1. 
The next equation, 3pi is equal to minus pi by 2 plus 2 pi n. And we obtain phi equals minus pi by 6 plus 2 pi n by 3. And finally, we obtain the full solution of this equation. z sub n is equal to e2 minus i pi by 6 plus 2 pi i n by 3. Now assume that we have a contradiction because n changes from minus infinity to plus infinity and we should have only three roots for a cubic equation. But let's plug in different n's to see how this issue is resolved. For example, n is equal to 0. Then z0 is equal to e2 minus i pi by 6. Alright, let's plug in n is equal to 1. We obtain the second root. e2 2 pi by 3 minus pi by 6. It's uh, pi by 2. So we obtain e2 i pi by 2, which is nothing but i. Now n is equal to 2. z2 is equal to e2 7 pi i by 6. Now let's try the next value of n. Say n is equal to 3. Then z3 is equal to e2 minus i pi by 6 plus, pay attention, 2 pi i. But the exponential is a 2 pi i periodic function, so we can get rid of this 2 pi i. And this way z3 actually coincides with z0. This way only three distinct values of n leads to three roots of this equation. All the other n's just cycle over the three roots. And to have a complete picture, let's plot these roots in a complex plane. The modulus of our roots is equal to 1, so all of them are positioned onto a union circle. The first root has an argument of minus pi by 6, so it's here. The second one is pi by 2, and the third root has an argument of 7 pi by 6, so it's symmetric to the first one with respect to vertical axis. So we see that these roots split the union circle into three equal parts, spanned by angle 2 pi by 3. So this is how we usually solve that kind of simple algebraic equations. And that completes our discussion of an exponential representation of a complex number. Try to have a good command of it, because in whole our future course we'll use it pretty often.